In this video, we'll present the far lateral approach for resection of her lower pontine cavernous malformation. The case refers to a 31-year-old man who presented with a one-week history of headaches, right arm weakness, and left cranial nerve 6th palsy. A CT scan revealed a hemorrhagic lesion in the left lower pons, and a T2 MRI showed the classic popcorn appearance of the cavernous malformation. An associate developmental venous anomaly was seen on the contrasted images at the medial border of the lesion. The cavernous malformation presented to the surface of the pons just above the pontomedular fissure and just superior to the left vertebral artery. Here on the KISS sequence, we can see the lesion marked with a star between the exit zones of crown nerve 6 and the 7-8 complex. It is useful to review some of the internal brainstem anatomy just above the pontomedullary junction. The mononuclei of crown nerve 6 and 7 are found at pontine tegmentum, whereas the basis pontus is dominated by the cortical spinal tracts. In between the two, we find the spinothalamic tracts straddled by the medial and lateral lemnisci. The hematoma in the basis pontus likely compressed the cortical spinal tracts and the intraparenchymal course of cranial nerve 6, causing the upper extremity weakness and ophthalmopheresis. A critical component for planning an approach to a brainstem cavernous malformation is the location of the cortical spinal tracts. It is useful to remember that the cerebral peduncle projections taper throughout the pons, with mainly cortical spinal fibers transitioning to the pyramids at the pontomedullary fissure, as the temporopontine and frontopontine fibers synapse throughout the pons. It is also useful to remember that the exit zone of the abducens nerve is a good approximation for the lateral border of the pyramid. The peritrigeminal entry zone is a well-described safe entry zone to the ventrolateral pons. This is roughly located between cranial nerves 5 and 7 and course behind the choral spinal tracts, only disrupting some of the mid and lower transverse pontine fibers. Using the peritrigeminal entry zone, there are a few options to approach our lesion. Through a retrosigmoid approach, there are typically difficulties in access in the posterior most components of the cavernous malformation. The pre-sigmoid retro-labyrinthine approach provides a more ventral angle of attack and can better access these dorsal components. However, we thought that a far lateral approach would still allow a relatively ventral angle of attack, but would provide improved access to the pontomedullary fissure where the adhesion presented to the surface, while aligning better with its long axis given its superior extension. The patient was secured in a park bench position, and a classic hockey stick incision was planned. The transverse sigmoid junction is approximated by a point 4.5 cm behind the AAC on a line connecting the root of the zygoma with the inion. Notably, somatosensory evoke potentials, motor evoke potentials, facial nerve, abducens nerve, lower current nerve, and brainstem EMGs were performed throughout the case. Auditory evoke potentials were also monitored. A single myocutaneous flap is elevated, leaving a cuff at the superior nuchal line for reapproximation, and a suboccipital craniotomy is performed along with a C1 laminectomy. Some of the paracondylar bone is drilled to allow a more ventral angle of attack. The dura is opened in a C-shaped fashion based laterally, and CSF is released from the cisterna magna, achieving brain relaxation. We proceed with arachnoidal dissection along the accessory nerve. We see the point of entry of the vertebral artery, and the uh, 7-8 complex is where the lower cranial nerves are dissected. Cranial nerve 5 is seen at the depth. Branches of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery are also dissected and preserved. Eventually, the point where the hematoma comes to the surface is seen on the ventral arrow pons just above the pontomedullary fissure. The surface of the pons is stimulated to confirm the absence of cortical spinal tracts. It appeared that a window under the cranial nerves uh, 9 and 10 would provide a better trajectory to the cavernous malformation at the pontomedullary fissure. After the arachnoid adhesions are dissected, a retractor is placed to retract the tonsil and enhance the exposure. Ica branches are dissected and mobilized from the pontomedullary fissure. Eventually, the origin of cranial nerve 6 comes into view, marking the lateral border of the pyramids and our medial border of exposure. After confirming our location and trajectory with image guidance, a small area of the PI is coagulated and opened, and shortly after, the hematoma is encountered. After some of the liquefied hematoma is released, the peel incision is extended a little bit, uh, but just within the confines of where the hematoma presents to the surface. 
A room six uh, can be used to bluntly start dissecting the cavernous malformation from the surrounding brainstem parenchyma. In contrast to the dissection technique in other less eloquent areas, uh, the use of the bipolar cautery should be limited. Once a plane has been established between the cavernous malformation and the surrounding parenchyma, a variety of instruments can be used to start developing this. Uh, this includes spreading of the bypass forceps or the use of a plate dissector from the wrong set. Once this plane is further developed and an edge is available, uh, the dusted diamond tip of uh, bypass forceps is a very useful grabbing tool uh, and the use of uh, traction, counter-traction technique with a suction as a dissector can be very useful in further developing this plane. Once a decent amount of this section has been performed, it is useful to partially debulk the camera's malformation so that it's easier to work with. The goal should generally be to remove the malformation in as few pieces as possible so as to maintain a dissection plane and avoid leaving any residual. That being said, removing the malformation in a piecemeal fashion is less traumatic to the surrounding parenchyma and allows for a smaller PA opening. As such, it's a fine balance and a judgment call to determine when the dissected lesion is becoming too bulky to work with, prompting the surgeon to debulk it by removing a piece. It is important to remember, though, when removing these pieces of the malformation, not to remove too much uh, or too large of a piece and lose the established dissection plane, as these may become tricky to reestablish at the depth of the resection cavity and when this resection cavity is partially collapsed. The use of pituitary forces can provide better purchase for larger pieces. A micro nerve hook can be very helpful in bringing to view small residual pieces on the side walls of the resection cavity. Again, bipolar cautery should only be used in a very targeted fashion for focal bleeding points. Some final residual pieces are removed from the medial wall of the resection cavity, taking care to avoid injury to the developmental venous anomaly. A careful final inspection of the resection cavity reveals no evidence of residual cavernoma. The surrounding hemocytoin ring is not chased in such elegant location. The dura is closed in a watertight fashion, uh, followed by replacement of the uh, bow flap. The muscle is closed in a multilayered fashion, followed by a running lock probing on the skin. Post-operative imaging revealed complete resection of the malformation. The patient had a dramatic improvement in his upper extremity strength, but minimal improvement in his abducent palsy at two weeks of follow-up. He had no new neurologic deficits or other complications.